In this lecture, I'd like to cover the question of historicity in the Gospel of John. By way of introduction, I'd like to say something about the development of the question in modern scholarship. The question of whether or not the Gospels offer us historicity or whether they are, say, for example, made up stories or highly uh, changed stories. Now, <clears throat> there is, of course, a lot to say about this since the story begins for biblical scholarship at the end of the 1700s and goes right up until the present day, although at the end of the modern period, we have a hypermodernity in the form of postmodernism, which we can say begins about the 1980s for our purposes. Now, the question of questioning historicity uh, is uh, a, something that arises with the coming of Rene Descartes. And Descartes in the 1600s wanted to establish faith on a firm foundation. And so he introduces a method of questioning everything so that he can have certainty. So while Descartes is a man of faith, he initiates a method that becomes uh, a method that is used against religion and against the church uh, in the modernist period. And uh, the simple method is this, you doubt everything. And Rene Descartes famously began by doubting whether he, uh, he might even exist. And he came to the conclusion in his argument that, well, that's one thing he can't doubt, because even if he is doubting, that proves that he exists to doubt. So uh, this method uh, is a method that begins with doubt. Applied to questions of historicity, you would doubt that every, anything in the Gospels is historical. And then the burden of proof falls on those who want to argue that something is historical. It's different from saying, well, let's begin by assuming that it's all historical, and we have to prove whether something isn't. Quite the opposite methodology. Now, the scientific method then is used in the modernist period to establish certainty. And during the modernist period, there is still a belief in objective truth after all, the scientific method wants to say that what we observe about our universe or about chemistry or about physics, uh, what we observe is something that is actually real. It's out there. Uh, and so the scientific method doesn't remain in doubt. Uh, but then what it tries to do is establish foundational certainty. What we are going to prove uh, has to be something that is um, absolutely certain and a good foundation on which to build anything else. And for Descartes, the fact that he existed then led him to try to say, well, we can say other things too are true. Whether you think he was successful in that exercise or not is another matter. But certainly the assumption is that if we can have scientific proof about things, then we can say other things too. Now, for the Gospels in the 19th century, this meant especially doubting miracles. Uh, the rationalism uh, uh, of, of the era uh, did not believe that miracles could happen. And so what was left then in the Gospels? What else could you prove? Could you say that Jesus really said something that the Gospel writers said that he said, and so forth? So this, this began a period uh, that is uh, told in a history written by Albert Schweitzer called The Quest for the Historical Jesus. And uh, what uh, he records are different attempts to try to 
come up with some kind of certainty about what Jesus believed and said. And Schweitzer famously uh, showed that presuppositions were what really led people to the conclusions that they came to. And so um, his, our, his own argument was that after a hundred years of trying to understand Jesus as a non-apocalyptic, non-messianic figure, the actual fact, Jesus really was that. And uh, so that's the certainty that Schweitzer came up with. But sadly, Schweitzer said that Jesus really did believe that he was Messiah and that he would establish a kingdom on the earth in his lifetime. And even in his death, he believed that God would rescue him from the cross. And so Schweitzer ended by saying, while Jesus believed he was Messiah, he was wrong. So this is where this kind of scholarship was at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, following Schweitzer came a short period of a few decades uh, associated especially with the name Rudolf Bultmann, uh, in which the belief was that we really can't say anything about the historical Jesus. We just can't get back to the history. We can't put anything certain in the foundations about the life of Jesus. But Bultmann's students in Germany uh, in the 1950s and 60s said, no, hang on a second, we can reapply a scientific method that can help us get to some certainty. And the next slide, we'll look at the criteria uh, some of those students of Bultmann came up with. But before we move to that, I want to say something about this most modern period, the postmodern period. The doubt of modernity became denial of objective truth in the postmodern period. And we could associate this with a number of different people. Uh, the philosopher Alistair McIntyre has focused on Michel Foucault as the spokesperson for this period. So I've put his picture up there as well. Uh, the denial of objective truth. What we, we, we always doubt our observations. We can't have certainty. And this was coupled with what is called in biblical studies, a literary turn in hermeneutics. Prior to this time, you have a more scientific model for hermeneutics where you're trying to, to uh, establish um, what you can know. How do we know what we know? And um, in hermeneutics, that was uh, done in the modern period through looking at historicity. So the history department was significant. And you come through ancient literature and you did your historical studies and then you came to your conclusions. But in a period where you deny objective truth, everything becomes literature. It's as if you no longer have a, um, a section in the library uh, that isn't fictional. Everything is fictional. Everything is literary. And related to that is the idea <clears throat> of constructed truth. This is an anti-foundationalism. You have one, your own truth. It is constructive, constructed uh, like a sandcastle and it can be washed away when high tide comes. It's functional. It, has, it serves its purpose, but it's not objective. And <clears throat> once it's, and it might serve a purpose for you that it doesn't serve for somebody else. And it's relative. Uh, this is a period of relativism. Um, there, again, there's no, no such thing as a universal or an absolute, and therefore everything is relative. So in this period, there is a, a mixture of 
the modern period and postmodern perspective. And you find this in scholars. It's interesting that these perspectives, while, while postmodernity developed out of modernity, it is actually uh, not only distinct from, but argues against basic assumptions that we've talked about in modernity, such as notion of truth. And so you find even in Supreme Court hearings, uh, some uh, some senators saying, well, we need to hear this person's truth. And that kind of language of someone has a truth, and it's not something that you necessarily have to establish, but it's how do people think and react and e e express themselves, and what function does that claim have, even if the claim itself can't be proven. So we find this throughout culture, <clears throat> and you find it uh, in a mixture in biblical studies too. How does it play out? Well, very briefly, and this is person by person or scholar by scholar issue, but sometimes you'll find scholars who are on the one hand arguing from a modernist perspective of looking for truth, and the next minute they're taking a more postmodern turn that uh, assumes that it's a bit of a game to do that. And in actual fact, some postmodern uh, academics have talked about this as a game that you play. Uh, so um, sometimes it's very difficult because the scholar will be slippery um, when you try to bear down on the modernist uh, uh, approach that they might be taking. They might switch over to a postmodern approach and say, well, it's all a matter of perception anyway. Uh, now, <clears throat> that is an overview. Obviously, it's a much larger lecture in the history of scholarship and the history of Western thinking. But I think this is the background for discussions of historicity in the Gospels where we are today. Uh, let's move now to that end of the modern period where the students of Boltmann were trying to come up with some criteria of authenticity in a scientific way in which they could say some things are historical in the Gospels. So the criteria of authenticity were at first three, and then some began to introduce a fourth. Uh, the first criterion is the criteria of dissimilarity. It's a radical criterion. You can see the doubt in it. It has to be um, established that something that Jesus does or says in the Gospels is dissimilar from both Judaism and early Christianity. You see, if it's so, if it stands out so radically from the cultural context, then it must somehow be, uh, be actually, actually be true. Uh, there are various ways in which scholars have tried to use this criterion. Uh, the baptism of Jesus is an example. Uh, it's difficult to connect the baptism of John with um, other practices in Judaism, even though there are similarities, like the mikvot, the ritual bathing, or the um, uh, bathing of a convert to Judaism. But uh, John's baptism seems to be somewhat unique. Now, the baptism of John, when John baptizes Jesus, this seems to be a problem for early Christianity. Why would Jesus, who had not sinned, according to the early church, need to be baptized? So it's this kind of way of reasoning uh, with the criteria of dissimilarity that scholars tried to say certain things did happen. Now, one example uh, that is relevant for the Gospel of John here as well is this use of the title by Jesus of Son of Man. This title falls out of use in the other New Testament authors once you move from the Gospels, say, to Paul. And the title, the term Son of Man uh, is a Jewish way of phrasing something, it could mean simply a human being, but as a title, it's rarely used. It may appear in a few Jewish documents, and those are significant, but the point is it's rare. 
And yet Jesus seems to have this as his preferred title of himself. Nobody calls Jesus son of man in the gospels. It's always a title on Jesus' lips of himself. Now, some scholars would debate whether it's always of himself or not, but it's on Jesus' lips. And it, um, in my view, it is always a, a term Jesus is using of himself. So John's gospel also has the title son of man. One of the questions in Johannian scholarship is whether John uses the title the same way as the synoptics, but the title itself seems to be proven on this criterion. A second criterion uh, that ca they came up with was the criterion of multiple attestation. This doesn't mean that you can find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, since there are literary relationships and dependency between the Gospels. Uh, I would follow the standard view that Mark was written first, and Matthew and Luke independently used Mark and then I would add, and some other sources that are sometimes called Q, uh, but Q is not a single source. Now, um, then how does this criterion of multiple attestation really work then? Well, you would say, okay, there's, there's this early work called Mark, and then there is this thing we're going to call Q, which is material that Matthew and Luke share in common. And then there's material that only Matthew has in his gospel, that would be M, or only Luke has in his gospel, that would be L. And then there are uh, the various stories and sayings of Jesus in John's gospel. Now, even if you think that John knew or used one or more of the synoptic gospels, he often represents an independent source. So it would be these uh, sources that could provide multiple attestation. Now, my example here is the language of kingdom. Jesus' message was about the kingdom, as was John the Baptist. The uh, language of kingdom only appears in two places, in three verses in all, in John's Gospel. And so it's not common in John's Gospel. It, it does appear in Paul as well, but it's not a common uh, way of phrasing theology or arguing uh, for Paul. And so the view here is that the language of kingdom we see all over the place in the synoptic gospels really does go to the historical Jesus. And what you see in a later gospel like John, if it is later, and in uh, writings like Paul, just a few decades after Jesus' life, um, is that the language of kingdom is falling out and other language is being used to express the same thing. So this would be an example of the criterion of multiple attestation. Criterion of coherence attempts to bring in a little bit more of the stuff that would have been sieved out or sifted out uh, by the first two criteria. It says that some story or belief that coheres with something established by another criterion could also be included as historical. So, for example, Jesus' understanding of himself as Messiah. Now, <clears throat> a lot of the uh, scholars who have been on the extreme doubt side of scholarship in the 20th century did not believe Jesus claimed to be Messiah. Uh, we saw that in the argument of the quest of the historical Jesus uh, in Albert Schweitzer. Um, they were trying to construct a Jesus who didn't claim to be Messiah. But that continued in the 20th century. And one of the key scholars associated with that view was William Breda in Germany. But it continued right through uh, the 80s. Um, and up to today with various scholars, but the, the, the third quest for the historical Jesus included some radical scholars in an SBL or Society of Biblical Literature group that were uh, claiming that there's very little that's historical about Jesus. And so this denial of that Jesus claimed to be Messiah is rather thoroughgoing 
in the modern and even postmodern period. Nevertheless, I think this functions as a good example of the criterion of coherence. If Jesus did indeed come talking about the coming of a kingdom through his ministry, then this associates what he teaches with uh, the question of who is he, who does he claim to be, and is he actually the Messiah who brings the kingdom? So uh, you can see that was as you move to the criterion of coherence, did the debate becomes more intense, and some will come up with a, a quite a different view from others, but the criterion would work this way in the argument. And then in the, this fourth point on the criteria of authenticity, uh, we have something that developed a little bit later than the other positions. And it does work a bit against the first criterion of dissimilarity, because it says, actually, if there are some things in Jesus' ministry that uh, fit the linguistic context, and the cultural context, then maybe they also are authentic. Again, this would be something that would be highly debatable uh, um, with uh, various scholars, but it would work this way. So in Mark's gospel, we see Jesus occasionally speaking Aramaic and his Aramaic words are recorded. He says to the little girl that he raises from the dead, Talitha kum or he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, Abba, which both of which are Aramaic words, uh, phrases. Now, when we come to John's Gospel in John chapter 15, where Jesus is talking about how he is the vine and his disciples are the branches, and we're reading Greek, of course, we come to chapter 15, verses 2 to 3, where there's a kind of pun. There's a play on words. Uh, Jesus talks about pruning the vine, and then he says to his disciples, you are, are already clean or pure. Now, those words sound very different, uh, prune and clean. They're, they're not related words. And so in many translations, it's difficult to see that there's any kind of connection or pun going on here in the Greek. But the Greek for prune is kathire, and the Greek for clean or pure is katharoi. And so you can see how Jesus moves from the example of pruning the vine to applying that to his disciples as clean um, because of the relatedness of the word. The words aren't uh, relate, actually related, but they sound similar. Uh, so we, we might say, well, <clears throat> given that we have the Aramaic in the Gospel of Mark, uh, should we assume that Jesus would speak to his disciples, all Jewish disciples, also in Aramaic? And I think that's a good argument, even though I think there's every reason to believe Jesus knew Greek as well. But um, <clears throat> the this is bolstered by the uh, example of how John does actually construct some sections in his gospel <clears throat> that reflect the Greek symbolic numbering. <clears throat> uh, he might count the syllables in the prologue, and uh, the syllables add up to the number monogenes, which is used twice in the prologue and is significant for understanding Jesus as the only uh, Son of God. And then um, in chapter 17, we have Jesus' prayer to the Father, and the vocative case, pater, for Father in Greek, equals the same number as the number of words, this time not syllables, that we have in the prayer itself. So you can see that John's gospel at times is working very much with the Greek. And the, uh, this uh, then would suggest that this is the author uh, presenting this, and it's not actually something like a, 
a verbal recording of what Jesus actually said. Now, that's not to deny historicity of what Jesus says, but it's to say that the way in which it's presented rhetorically by John is something that uh, represents the author's hand. Uh, and I think that's fairly obvious in lots of other ways as well. We don't have videotape and we don't have an audio recording of what Jesus said. So the authors do introduce their own way of presenting things, just as a pastor might present the same material in a different sermon uh, from someone else preaching on the same text. So now, what about the question of historicity in John's Gospel? What I would like to do is to present uh, the arguments of one scholar and then respond to that for the rest of this lecture. And the scholar I've chosen is someone named Andrew Lincoln, a British scholar, at one point taught in the U.S. And he uh, has had a long career of writing commentaries and other books, uh, especially on the Gospel of John. <clears throat> his his work, uh, his, his initial dissertation as a doctoral student was on Ephesians, and he has a commentary on Ephesians as well. I consider Andrew Lincoln a very good scholar. He is a man of faith, although he is not representative of evangelicalism, and he does represent some extreme uh, positions of doubt on historicity at times. Now, his uh, recent book on the virgin birth uh, is discussed uh, on the YouTube um, URL that's given here on the slide. And uh, this is yet another example of his approaching questions with a perspective of doubt. Uh, he believes that he can find three different views, conflicting views, in the New Testament about the virginity of um, Mary uh, with the birth of Jesus. Now, I, I completely disagree with him, but we're not going to focus on that subject. Rather, we're going to look at his discussion of uh, historicity in John's Gospel, and especially the first miracle that Jesus did, the miracle at Cana. His commentary on John, Lincoln doubts that the first miracle is real. And we have a number of arguments to look over in the next few slides. First is the argument of parallels uh, in two different forms. So parallels with Old Testament stories and then parallels with some sayings of Jesus from the Synoptic Gospels are what we're going to look at. Uh, Lincoln says, first of all, that there is a parallel to the turning water into wine uh, in John 2, 1 through 11 with 1 Kings 17. There we read about how Elijah's miraculous supply of meal and oil to the widow of Zarephath uh, occurred, and then it was followed with the death of the widow's son. And Lincoln points out that we have the miraculous supply of wine in John 2. And then the second miracle that takes place at Cana in John 4, 46 through 54, is about the death of a royal official's son. Uh, the royal official who comes from Capernaum to Jesus in Cana, and Jesus uh, provides healing and restoration to the sun uh, without being present. Now that, uh, he suggests, is a parallel. And where the assumption is that where there's a parallel, there may be a constructed story. Now, it may well be that there is a parallel. In fact, I think there are lots of parallels between Elijah and Elisha and Jesus' ministry. But that may well be Jesus' intentional connecting and not the uh, author of John making those connections. In other words, Jesus may have done similar miracles to Elijah and Elisha as a way of bringing out the belief uh, that Jesus was fulfilling 
the prophecy uh, Malachi chapter 4 speaks of Elijah coming and so here we have the possibility that um, yes Jesus is fulfilling this kind of prophecy fulfilling it not only in the sense of being a, another Elijah but being more than another Elijah and who he was now the second kind of parallel that Lincoln looks at is the possibility of creating a story out of a parable Jesus says something well now a story is constructed the story isn't historical but it's constructed out of uh, something Jesus said and his example is the saying in Mark chapter 2 18 to 22 about the bridegroom and the new wine and in Luke chapter 5 uh, Luke's version has Jesus say can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them and then in verse 39 comes the uh, statement about old and new wine being compared you know there's this previous wine and the wine that Jesus created in John 2 but uh, he the, Lincoln does know there's a difference it's the old wine um, not the new that's favored in the Lucan story now Lincoln says certainly the account of the miracle reflects these themes but then he adds whether the Lucan sayings in themselves provide a sufficient basis for the construction of the miracle is another matter so he's sitting on the fence on that issue key to Lincoln's argument uh, is the idea that what Jesus does at Cana parallels some thinking about the god Dionysus Dionysus was the Greek god of fertility and new life he was called Bacchus in the Roman world and his title titles included savior fruit bringer and abundance of life and you can see how someone working with thematic relationships and ideas might be led to imagine that what we have here is um, some parallel with what John is trying to do with Jesus now Dionysus origins were that he was a god and he was a divine son of Zeus and he had a mortal mother Semele now here again the suggestion is there's some possible paralleling of who Jesus was with who Dionysus was Dionysus also is called twice born and in one story of his birth he is uh, presented as a fetus that survives his mother's death and then is planted in the thigh of Zeus and in another he as a boy is born from Persephone the goddess of the underworld and is torn to shreds Zeus places his heart in Semele from whom he is then born a second time uh, furthermore uh, one story of Dionysus tells of how he descended to the underworld and brought his human mother back to life sharing his immortality and Dionysus life involved various exploits which culminated in his ascension to heaven having proved through those exploits that he was indeed divine and so with events like these that is the miracles performed during his earthly wanderings men learned that Dionysus was a god and they began to honor him says Apollodorus So Lincoln presses the point further on the particulars of wine and turning water into wine. Pausanias writes, three pots are brought into the building by the priests and set down empty in the presence of the citizens and of any strangers who may chance to be in the country. The doors of the building are sealed by the priests themselves and by any other uh, who may be so inclined on the morrow they are allowed to examine the seals and on going into the building they find the pots filled with wine 
Then there's some other uh, writings from antiquity around this. Dionysus makes rivers taste like wine in uh, Lucian, in Pliny. We read that springs produce wine on the days that celebrate this god's appearance. And Achilles Tatius says that Dionysus visits a herdsman who can only offer him water as vines do not exist there. The drink becomes wine and they dance for joy. Dionysus then shows him the vine that produces the, the, the wine. Now another um, part of the argument is the place of origin of John's Gospel and the place where Dionysus was particularly um, acknowledged. Uh, now he was acknowledged all throughout the ancient world, but particularly in Ephesus. Uh, John's Gospel is associated with Asia Minor and particularly Ephesus. And this is uh, also where there are stories about both John the Disciple and John the Elder uh, living. So either John is associated with Ephesus. Now the same location is where stories about Dionysus abounded. So um, you could say, but it's known that Dionysus, Dionysus or ba the Bacca cult was known throughout the ancient world. And that is also true. Another point that is brought up by Lincoln is the integration of Dionysiac stories into Jewish stories. Here the argument is that there's a practice of uh, one religion picking up some notions of one sort or another from another religion, and in this case the Dionysiac religion. So there are Haggadic legends, that stories in Judaism, that speak of miraculous supplies of wine in the days of the patriarchs. And there's uh, another um, work that says that the water that came out of the rock when Moses struck it tasted like new wine. And Philo speaks of Melchizedek and Moses in terms of Dionysus, paralleling by a Jewish author in the first century of these two Old Testament figures with God Dionysus. Furthermore, uh, Lincoln says that there are comparisons with rulers and Dionysus. The rulers in the Greco-Roman world were depicted as being providers of life. And Alexander the Great, and the Roman emperors Trajan, Hadrian, and Commodus. And Commodus is depicted as the new Dionysus. In Marshall, we read that um, Domitian is greater than the god Bacchus or Dionysus. Now, Lincoln moves on to talk about what kind of a writer was this author of John's Gospel. And he notes the creativity of the evangelist. He says the evangelist is also capable of creating history-like material that points to the significance of Jesus and his mission. Lincoln suggests the following examples for this. The story of Jesus and Nicodemus, the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the story of Jesus and the raising of Lazarus from the dead, and the story of the flow of blood and water from Jesus' side on the cross. He suggests these aren't historical, but they're history-like material. Thirdly, he talks about elusiveness in this story in John 2 of the turning of water into wine. The presence of gaps in the story of one sort or another suggests to Lincoln that the story is made up. He notes that other miracle stories are not as elu elusive in John, but this one has elusive elements. Only the servants know the origin of the water turned into wine. Neither they nor Jesus' mother comment on the miracle, but the disciples do even though they were not mentioned as part of the miracle. And also the master of the banquet seems a better designation in the Greco-Roman city than in a Galilean village where people know each other. All this suggests it's not historical to him. 
Another category to consider is the category of Johannine features. The more in the story that seems to be typical of John the author, the more one may question whether the story is a report on history. Lincoln says this, a longer quote from him, Jesus' relation to his mother, the pattern of request, the rebuff, and then response of Jesus on, on Jesus' own terms, the motifs of the hour and of the ignorance of the origin of Jesus' gift, the theme of fulfillment or replacement of Jewish observances, the spectacular nature of the miracle, it says in parentheses, the other signs all have features showing Jesus is surpassing the miraculous activities depicted in synoptics. Then the symbolism of the wine is the abundance Jesus provided for living and of the wedding at which Jesus is the true bridegroom. All of these key ingredients of the meaning of the account derive from the evangelist's distinct perspective which fashions the gospel as a whole. Fifth point, uh, the real point of the story is not its facticity. This gets to the question of uh, when you read a story, is the point of the story history or not? Uh, someone like Lincoln would say the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is historical. The point of the story of Jesus' resurrection is that it happened. But he's suggesting that this story is uh, thematic in importance, not in historicity. And so he makes the actually logical jump to say, therefore, uh, we can question its facticity. Anyway, he says the points of the story are as follows. The extraordinariness and extravagance, Jesus' divine power, Jesus offers the gift of the new life of the new age. This contrasts with the law. This is greater than rival claims from the gods and imperial rulers. Uh, Jesus offers what is needed for human existence and joyful living. The first and last I am saying have the theme of wine or vine in John 15, 1. Jesus feeds the multitude in John 6 and says, I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. John 10, 10 and compare 1, 16. And then this first sign offers a way to understand the subsequent signs. So let's begin our uh, response to someone like Lincoln and t talk in favor of this by noting genre as an issue. And genre, I think, is a very important issue here. Uh, can biography as a form of history uh, really handle this much inventiveness in antiquity? Now, the discussion about the Gospels as biography has uh, been developed rather well in recent decades and capturing the most recent kind of discussion around this is the uh, work in his commentary on John's Gospel by Craig Keener. Keener argues, no, you cannot have this kind of inventiveness in this sort of genre. I'd like to just add a few comments to what is otherwise an excellent discussion by Keener. And my, my comment would be to point out a similar type of work to the Gospels uh, in uh, a work by a Greek author named Lucian in the second century. And among his writings is this work, Alexander the False Prophet. Uh, Lucian is reporting the exploits and sayings of an historical figure but he believes that this person was up to nothing more than religious chicanery. And Alexander's activity is not made up by Lucian. Rather, Lucian reports what he knows about Alexander and then tries to debunk him as a false prophet. The gospel writers also, I would argue, present the story as they know it. They're not making up the stories. The difference between the gospel writers writing about Jesus and Lucian writing about Alexander is that the gospel writers believe that Jesus did these things, whereas Lucian believes that he 
uh, Alexander did these things, but he was uh, pulling the wool over people's eyes. Um, he was making it look like he was doing miracles. That's quite different from what we find with Lincoln arguing that the gospel writer is making up miracles that Jesus never did or and Jesus never tried to pull the wool over people's eyes. So that's that's I think is a significant difference and that has to do with the kind of genre we're in. Uh, Lucian begins his work by writing to the person who commissioned it. He says, no doubt, my dear Celsus, you think it a slight and trivial matter to bid me to set down in a book and send you the history of Alexander, the imposter of Abinotychus, including all his clever schemes, bold enterprises and sleights of hand. But in point of fact, if one should aim to examine each detail closely, it would be no less a task than to record the exploits of Philip's son, Alexander. The one was as great a villain as the other a hero. So similarly, uh, John believes that Jesus did certain things that he reports, but he also believes Jesus was a true Messiah, son of God. And this we get as the last verse for the turning of water into wine. In chapter 2, verse 11, we read in John's Gospel, Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So John is saying, I'm reporting an actual story. And Jesus did things uh, as signs to bring people to belief in him, and his disciples did believe in him. And uh, the signs uh, were signs that revealed his glory. Uh, John's gospel as a whole ends with this conclusion in chapter 20, the first conclusion, verses 30 to 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So we might well ask, why would John need to invent a story to the exclusion of the other unmentioned stories that really happened? John believes these stories happened and he's selecting certain ones for the purposes of his gospel. He's not inventing stories to, uh, over against the actual stories that took place. So the genre argument, I think, is rather uh, significant. A second argument then has to do with parallels. And I would suggest that we need to think about interpretive historicity, interpretive historicity. It is possible that Jesus did certain things and said certain things so that people would draw parallels between people like Elijah, Elisha, and himself, as well as other persons, particularly Moses and David. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 and 18, uh, we uh, read that we should expect someone to arise like Moses. And in Malachi 4, 5, we read that someone like Elijah, or Elijah, the way the text writes it, is going to rise up. And these texts are messianic texts, texts in Judaism. The one to come, the Messiah, the anointed one, is a mosaic or uh, prophetic-like figure. Um, and so uh, if Jesus comes understanding himself to be uh, someone like a Moses or someone like an Elijah, then we can expect him to do things like these earlier persons from the Old Testament. In other words, there's an intentionality on Jesus' side to do things that would reflect the Old Testament. Just because you have a parallel does not mean that the author of the book is the one inventing that. So interpretive, intentional, historical parallels are for all the intertextuality nonetheless still historical.
we also need to be aware of something that scholars in New Testament studies since 1962 have been talking about with the language of parallelomania. Samuel Sandmel wrote about this in his address to the Society of Biblical Literature, and it's published in the Journal of Biblical Literature for 1962. Uh, Sandmel picked up the word from someone else that he'd read, but he, he was warning biblical scholarship of drawing, uh, noting parallels between certain things uh, in one writing and another, and then trying to talk about influence. Just because something is, has a parallel doesn't mean it's influenced it. Uh, we need to argue more tightly about whether there's influence than just noting a parallel. We need to prove detailed study, not abstract parallels. Now, to apply Sandmel's point, we might say that the parallels with Dionysus that uh, Lincoln points out could be stronger if John wished to compose a story to contrast Jesus and Dionysus. It is not impossible that a Greek Roman, Greco Roman reader might make such comparisons, especially if the location of the gospel is in Asia Minor and Ephesus. But from an author's perspective, the parallels could have been drawn much tighter. If John had the freedom to invent stories that Lincoln claims he did, he did not use that freedom very well to draw out the comparisons with Dionysus clearly. Uh, there are parallels, but there are not, there's not evidence of influence. And the authors, uh, the, the, the readers of John's gospel in Asia Minor may well have drawn parallels themselves between Jesus and Dionysus uh, because of their context but that has nothing to do with the historicity of the story itself. Furthermore, we might talk about rhetorical and theological features. It may be that the telling of a story is influenced by other literature or stories, such as Old Testament language or even Dionysiac stories, although I don't see it in the case of Dionysus. But this is very different from suggesting that the story is not historical. This would also go for John's own rhetorical and theological characteristics. None of this requires an argument against historicity. The movement of the cleansing of the temple in John's gospel to chapter two, instead of the end of Jesus' ministry, like in the synoptics, is evidence perhaps of John's freedom to present stories to make certain points. The miracle at Cana is like the cleansing of the temple. John makes changes, rhetorical or arrangement, for certain reasons, but this does not make the story unhistorical. We might say, for example, that uh, John records Jesus' cleansing of the temple, just as do all three synoptic gospels, and Nobody's arguing against the historicity that Jesus cleansed the temple. Yet for his purposes, John can bring out certain emphases in the story rhetorically, and he can relocate the story in, to John chapter 2, perhaps. And uh, that, he, that kind of freedom he does have, but not the freedom to invent the story in the first place. Also, experience of miracles by Jesus' audience, as well as by contemporary readers like ourselves, makes it difficult to appreciate arguments against the historicity of a miracle. Now, Lincoln is in a particularly awkward position where he doesn't want to say he disbelieves in miracles. He wants to say that for all the reasons he lists, he just disbelieves in certain of the miracles, like the turning of water into wine. But it's difficult when you believe in miracles to start to uh, argue that some miracles aren't happening and other miracles are, especially when John himself says he's chosen the miracles to help you come to belief. 
if someone discovered that that miracle had not taken place, it would do the exact opposite of help you come to belief. Related to the argument from genre is also the argument from uh, eyewitness testimony. And the scholar who's best known for discussing eyewitness testimony in the Gospels, including John's Gospel, is Richard Baucom. Now, uh, just a few things to say then about this. Uh, we see that there is good reason to take seriously the claim in John's Gospel that what we are reading is eyewitness testimony. It's explicitly claimed for the author of John in the second conclusion to the Gospel in chapter 21, verses 24 to 25. Uh, other New Testament writings show a concern for eyewitness testimony. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, um, and Acts 1, 21 through 23, the events around Jesus' death and resurrection uh, are events that have eyewitness testimony, and this is important. It's not just a theology that could be around a made-up story that's important, but it's actually the historicity that's important as well. And eyewitness testimony particularly applies to Jesus' death and resurrection, but it also applies to the intentions of the gospel writers. Uh, in the early second century, according to Eusebius's ecclesiastical history, uh, someone named Papias uh, in the church uh, states that he prefers eyewitness testimony over hearsay or even written records. He's still early enough in the history of the church where he can reference eyewitness testimony himself um, with a, and it shows that he has a concern for accuracy and avoiding any falseness. Uh, he, we read about him in this ecclesiastical history of Eusebius since uh, his works don't come to us independently. But Papias said, and John the Presbyter also said this, Mark being the interpreter of Peter, Whatsoever he recorded, he wrote with great accuracy, but not, however, in the order in which it was spoken or done by our Lord. For he neither heard nor followed our Lord, but, as before said, was in com company with Peter, who gave him such instruction as was necessary, but not to give a history of our Lord's discourses. Wherefore, Mark has not erred in anything by writing some things as he has recorded them, for he was carefully attentive to one thing, not to pass by anything that he heard or to state anything falsely in these accounts. And what Papias is claiming is that the story of Jesus as we read it in Mark's gospel has a certain arrangement to it that doesn't uh, present the events in historical chronological order. But nevertheless, the events are themselves historical and that Mark had that concern. Um, and what Mark is doing is he's writing down the eyewitness testimony of Peter. Uh, Papias goes on uh, to say, For I have never, like many, delighted to hear those that tell many things, but those that teach the truth. Uh, neither those that record foreign precepts, but those that are given from the Lord to our faith. And that came from the truth itself. But if I met with anyone who had been a follower of the elders anywhere, I made it a point to inquire, what were the declarations of the elders? What was said by Andrew, Peter, or Philip? What, what by Thomas, James, John, Matthew, or any of the other disciples of our Lord, what was said by Aristion and the Presbyter John, disciples of the Lord. For I do not think that I derived so much benefit from books as from the living voice of those that are still surviving. What this points to is the presence of eyewitness testimony from a number of sources, the disciples, uh, in the early church that is still a strong enough testimony in this early second century when Papias lived.
Later in the second century, Irenaeus says something about eyewitness testimony as well. He says, I remember the events of that time more clearly than those of recent years. For what boys learn growing with their mind becomes joined with it, so that I am able to describe the very place in which the blessed Polycarp sat as he discoursed, and his goings out and his comings in and the manner of his life and his physical appearance and his discourses to the people, and the accounts which he gave of his intercourse with John and with the others who had seen the Lord. And as he remembered their words and what he heard from them concerning the Lord and concerning his miracles and his teachings, having received them from the eyewitness of the word of life, Polycarp related all things in harmony with the scriptures. Irenaeus writes in the latter part of the second century AD, and he knew Polycarp, who as an aged man was put to death for his faith. But Polycarp knew John and he knew some of the other eyewitnesses of uh, what happened in uh, Jesus' life. So here you have three steps, what, what Jesus said in his own time, what those who followed him were able to say in their old age, uh, and then what someone like Polycarp was able to report, and then also Irenaeus uh, uh, reporting what Polycarp said. Uh, you don't have even within this period of 150 years, you don't have a lot of room for historical error to creep in when you have multiple testimonies by people who can still recite eyewitness accounts uh, to the events. And this is the argument that Irenaeus is making. So let's suppose that John had made some story up in the climate of uh, this eyewitness testimony concern of the early church and the presence of multiple eyewitnesses, it would have been very difficult for a work like that to survive unchallenged. In fact, I would suggest it would be impossible. In conclusion, I'd like to say that John is concerned with belief, but his concern with belief is a concern that you believe not only in Jesus Christ and who he is, but also that you believe that who Jesus was and what he said and did in his life did take place. So we come back again to the conclusion, which is in verses 30 and 31 in John chapter 20. But let's add to it the ending of the story of Jesus' encounter with uh, Thomas after the resurrection. Thomas said he would not believe unless he actually uh, touched Jesus and saw him. And so the conclusion in verse 29 reads, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. See, Belief is the key, but not despite the historicity. The belief includes the historicity of the event, in this case, the resurrection. But now we continue, now this gets broadened to be more than just about the resurrection, to about the entire life of Jesus as presented in the gospel. So verse 30 then picks up. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. John's purpose of recording the miracle stories and the whole of his gospel is to present what he knows of the historicity of Jesus that can lead people to belief. Not belief apart from that, but belief um, based on what is presented. So the purpose of writing this is to record the historical events. 
not to develop a theology that involves making up of history. You either believe John or you don't. And if you believe John, then you have to make the further con uh, conclusion uh, one way or the other. John's purpose was to record things historically. Do you believe that Jesus was a false prophet like Alexander in Lucian's work, or do you believe Jesus was who he said he was? That's the challenge that John's gospel leaves us. And it's a challenge that involves both history and confession of faith.